Well, good morning to everybody. It's a little awkward, I know, but I think I, I think I have to be up here because of the video recording and um, providing some opportunity. But um, I really want to thank uh, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network Firehouse for making itself available. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this morning. And you're being here today, I think, is a reflection of what my campaign is all about. Uh, for, for public advocate. When I became Speaker of the New York City Council uh, in 2014, one of the things that I really wanted to focus on was ensuring that us as a legislative body were accountable right, to the diverse constituencies across the city. So we set up uh, a division that was specifically set up to engage and make ourselves accessible as a legislative body to the community and ethnic media. We really made that a priority um, of, of the speakership and my leadership. And so when I decided to run for public advocate, you know, that was something that I carried over. My campaign is a five borough campaign. My campaign is one that is reflective of the beautiful diversity uh, that this city has. And one of the things that I really wanted to do from the onset was to ensure that we were communicating that. So when we did the launch, if you can see here, you know, some of you may have been at the launch. You know, our launch was very much about demonstrating visibly uh, that we wanted to communicate with the diverse communities and constituencies across the city. So we had Arabic, obviously, and Chinese, and in Spanish, uh, in terms of being able to say, <clears throat> this is what we want to do, and be uh, embracing of that. So we want to be able to engage with all of you to say that you will have a front row seat as this campaign evolves. You know, we want our, our website to also be reflective and multilingual. Uh, we want to be able to communicate through our press advisories. So the idea of having this community ethnic roundtable came from that commitment that I have uh, to all of you. And uh, we know that our diverse constituencies across the city get their information in multiple ways. Uh, some of them do not rely on mainstream media. They, go, they get their information through other sources. And so we wanted to make sure that it was clear that we are aware of that and that we were reaching out. So having said that, you know, I'm really excited about my campaign uh, for public advocate and bringing the track record that I have and now taking and utilizing this role, which is a very different role uh, than being a council member or being the president of a legislative body, being able to really use the bully pulpit that it provides to advocate for issues that, uh, that New Yorkers care about. I have really uh, started my campaign focusing a lot on, uh, on being a voice around the frustration that we all have with our public transit system and obviously with our New York City Housing Authority where we have uh, close to half a million New Yorkers that live in this important affordable housing that is literally falling apart around us. Um, but those are just two examples of issues that obviously I care passionately about. Uh, during my leadership, my speaker, my, during my time as speaker, uh, I was very vocal around immigration matters, very vocal around criminal justice reform. Uh, and so I wanna continue to really be an advocate on those issues. I also want the role of public advocate to be one that is engaging with the constituencies that I seek to represent so that the constituencies are able to define for me how best do they think this office can serve them. What are the issues that you care about and how can we use the office of public advocate to kind of raise visibility, to do investigations, to do research, to figure out policy solutions to those issues, right? So I think we hand that out. I mean, this is just very quickly bullet points about the role of the public advocate. I wanted to make sure people understood what it was. Uh, but then being able to, as I indicated, you know, I want to be able to set up a division within the public advocate's office that will do uh, research and investigations. Uh, also aggressively do hearings out throughout the communities around issues of concern. And then legislation, which is obviously something that the public advocate can, can do, is introduce legislation to the city council to try to address uh, uh, issues and, and, and make sure that we're answering to the issues that have been raised by the communities, what we've heard through public hearings, et cetera. So we want this office to be very much uh, of a constantly engaging with community uh, and not just too much of a top-down approach, right? I want to figure out how I can bring in and let people know that this office is there to serve them and that we are there to find solutions to challenges, right? I don't just want to beat my chest and scream right at the top of my lungs. I'm very much a, a solution-oriented leader. I want to find solutions that work uh, to some of our more, more challenging uh, issues before us. Like I mentioned, public housing is critical, uh, and then also uh, uh, the MTA and, and the issues there. So we'll be rolling out a series of policy ideas in the upcoming weeks. Uh, very excited about the level of energy and the support that I've been getting. Uh, was anybody here during the launch? When we did the launch last week at BMCC? Okay, 
Well, the, the launch, I mean, was really a, a reflection of what our city has to offer. So I, I had, um, you know, it was really reflective. And as I mentioned, I want this to be a five borough campaign and one where I'm communicating and let it, letting people know that the work I've done over the years and over the decades as an activist and a, as an elected official, that coalition building uh, is going to be reflected in, in how we, uh, how this campaign is run. And so I'll leave it there. I, I, you know, would, I'd rather the engagement, if you have specific questions that you want to ask, I'm more than happy to answer. So I'm going to leave it there. Yes. Your position, a driver license for undocumented immigrants. I support it. Yeah. I've, I've supported it for years. There's some, you know, there's positions that I've supported for many years. Um, when I was council member, I think that was when Spitzer was the governor, we came very close to getting the licenses. And the pushback was so <coughs> severe at the time that we, it got shelved and it got knocked out. But I think that, you know, that issue has, has risen again. We've been seeing New Jersey, right, has taken some steps. Uh, there has been a conversation. There is, my understanding, a verbal commitment from the governor to figure out how to push this forward. Um, so definitely, I would add, and, and just, again, this is a position that I've held for many years and, and one that I do support. I understand it's very, we're in very scary times right now with this administration and any sort of, information that is captured, people are afraid of what may happen to it. Uh, but I think that the, that's a conversation that we need to have about like, this is something that, the, that the, the community wants, and this is something that we should figure out as a state how we can support. So, um, but yes, I do support it. Hi. Um, yes, sir. Okay, uh, when any public you know, official they elected, then the bureaucracy make them like kind of isolated. How you can make sure that you can diversify your stuff and make sure that you are you know, connected with all the community. How are you going to ensure that? Listen, I think all I can do is encourage people, right? Our information is public data. Uh, and if you want to take a look at what the data was at the time that I became speaker and the time that I left my speakership in terms of how uh, we diversified the staff in the council, uh, I take very much, obviously, you know, we want the highest quality staff. And as a legislative body, we are professional and wanted to be a professional body and are a professional body. So I wanted to make sure that we had the highest caliber candidates, but also understanding that as a Latina, as someone that has fought for equality and tried to make inroads because we know we're severely underrepresented, not only in government, but we're severely re uh, underrepresented in upper level management positions in government. I was very aware of that. So when I became speaker, I wanted to really encourage to expand and do outreach in the diverse communities, give me your best candidates, let's look at, and we really diversified the staff extensively. Uh, and very happy and proud of what that looked like. It was more of a reflection of New York City. Um, I'm not sure if that has continued, I'm not sure where that stands now, but that is the same um, energy and the same vision that I'm gonna bring into the Office of the Public Advocate. Obviously, uh, this is a much different responsibility and role. The budget is very limited and the staffing is very limited, but I definitely want the staffing to be reflective again um, of the best of the best and the diversity of our city. So that's something that I'm always very mindful of and that will continue to be um, the way that I lead. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you mentioned you will fight for improving the subways and public housing. I think we know what your views are uh, regarding Long Island City and the coming Amazon. The Amazon deal, yeah. Yes, uh, but what about the subway system in that area and what other areas throughout the five boroughs um, could be a target uh, for improv improvement under your leadership? Look, look you know, the, the, the our city, it's survival, economic survival, the people being able to get to work on time, people being able to take their children to school and pick them up without delay or you know, infringing upon their ability to, to, um, to work. You know, we, need, we, we need a reliable transit system. And I've always been a supporter of uh, alternative means of transportation as well, but our first priority needs to be on how do we get the subways up to speed, so to speak, right? Now, I was appointed to this working group by the mayor. I've been on this working, uh, what is it called? It's the sustainability working group uh, to figure out additional revenue or ways that we can sustain the MTA. This is a crisis. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars in capital upgrades and repairs that are needed. And so we need to be all hands on deck 
and nothing should be off the table. The fact that in 2018 going into 19, we're still talking about whether or not we're gonna support congestion pricing to me is outrageous. Um, we've seen how congestion pricing has worked in other major cities across the world. We need to have done that, right? I've been a supporter of congestion pricing back from 2007, 2008, when I was one of the few voices, um, and we're still now 10 years later at a point where we're still having a conversation about whether or not we're gonna do it. So. And that's just an example where we have to really see this as the crisis that it is and like how do we convene like a task force or you know a real emergency uh, working group to put all minds you know into the conversation the same with nitra you know nitra eh, my my fear and I, I we represent this community is where i live is the community i represented this community has the largest density of public housing in the country i represented the most public housing in the country it is a priority and I care about it deeply. And the deplorable conditions that people that live in public housing are living is unacceptable. You know, we have literally like the rats and the crumbling and the mold and the repairs. You know, the amount of energy that between the governor and the mayor they put into striking this deal for Amazon, where is that energy and commitment to making public housing a priority? Like, why aren't we putting the best minds and like the ideas at the table and figuring out solutions? You know, to me, it's, it's at a point where, you know, there's conversations about whether or not NYCHA is gonna go into federal receivership. That should scare us all, particularly in this climate that is extremely hostile to black and brown people, to immigrant communities, to poor people. You know, the idea of the federal government having, look, my hairs are standing up, literally. That, that is a, very, a, a, fear, a fear of mine because what will happen to our public housing stock, which is so important, we have to safeguard it and we have to make sure that we're improving the quality of life for the residents that live in it. So I'm very committed to that and figuring out. Um, a lot of talk has happened, a lot of hearings have been held, but I think that there's something else that we can present and some other ideas that we can put forward and I'm really, really committed to that. Hi. Um, Sorry, it's a long answer, but you know, I wanted to get to it because um, I care about that a lot. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, is an investigation on the um, Trump organization something within um, something that you can theoretically do if someone filed a complaint? Well, I mean, that's happening. You know, the AG's office is doing that right now. So I think that they're best suited to do that. I think what the relationship of the public advocate is really to the directly with constituencies and what is their relationship to government services. So if you as a constituent call me and say, I have a child in the foster care system, right? And I think ACS is doing a horrible job for X, Y, Z reasons. You know, we have to investigate that. We would have to look into that um, and also provide the, the appropriate constituent services. So I think directly, right, our responsibility is to the city, oversight over city agencies, holding the administration and the mayor accountable, um, investigating, as I said, having hearings, figuring out if we can recommend policy recommendations, and then if maybe, maybe out of that conversation, an idea for legislation may emerge, and introducing legislation to rectify that issue. So, you know, one of the roles, as you see in the paper that we handed out, the Public Advocates Office has a lot of access to data, right, and complaint data and other data that comes from these city agencies. So that also is something that you can research, and you can get a lot of information from the data that you get and figure out how we can, how we can find solutions to some of those challenges. So, uh, yeah, I don't, that's more, your question is more, I think it's something that the AG's office uh, is greater oversight because the AG's office has the Charities Bureau as part of it and the Charities Bureau is the one that has oversight over nonprofits and foundations. And so that's where a lot of that probably is better suited there. Yes, I think, oh, and you, oh, you have the mic, sorry, yes. Uh, so the other day, a MTA board member said he never rode the bus before. Oh, yes. And so you got on Twitter and you showed him how to do it. <laughs> and you, I believe you said that you rode the bus, like uh, six different buses the other day. Yeah. Um, so we uh, talk all the time about the subway and how bad it is. What do you think of the status of the New York City bus system? Do you think it needs improvement? Where would that improvement be? Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, look, I... If I have time, and actually it's funny when that happened, I was actually on the bus when I was going to a meeting when it was tweeted that this board member had said that. That's why I was doing those tweets. Like, I'm actually in the bus. This is what happened. But, you know, I, I, if I have time, I prefer to, to ride the bus, but obviously I'm all over the city, so I have to ride the subways a lot and, and experience both. Uh, but definitely with regards to SBS, which I think is great, the idea of trying to figure out how do we 
create more lines. But the issue of congestion is a problem. That's why also congestion pricing is so important. Congestion is, is not allowing those buses to ride as effectively or as quickly as they can in these dedicated bus lanes. So the issue of enforcement comes up constantly um, on how do we make sure that those lanes are free and that people aren't riding in the lanes, right? Uh, so congestion pricing, is that's one for many reasons it, that it can improve your travel time when it comes to public transit. Uh, and I think that that's an area that's overlooked. I know that in Byford's plan, he's been having these conversations across uh, boroughs um, to figure, or not, figure ways to be more effective in the bus routes, whether or not we want to consolidate bus routes, whether we want to minimize bus routes, whether you know, we eliminate some, uh, uh, some bus stops to try to figure out how to make the system more effective. I think that's a good conversation to have. I think it's great to really involve people in those conversations because we're the ones that are living the experience. And if you have a board member that's making decisions about the MTA and what's in the best interest, and he's not even writing one of the major you know, aspects of the MTA, which is the bus system, it's ridiculous. How do you make decisions in a vacuum? Uh, so, you know, that idea of engaging the constituencies and communities to like talk about what are your thoughts, these are some ideas we have, what do you think about them, getting feedback, I think that's the way government should be more consistently. And that's why I said that my idea of like participatory governance, which is always something I've, I've um, valued, the idea of having conversations with constituencies and letting them understand what the role of the public advocate is, and then well, how do you think we can best work with you? How do you think this office can best serve you? Let the communities decide what my agenda is going to be. I think that's an important part of the work as once I get into office. Hi, uh, from Korea Daily. Um, what is your stance on the mayor's plans for the specialized high school and desegregation for the public schools? Look, that's, I know it's a very charged question. I, I believe in obviously community conversation and I think the idea of having all of our city public system and schools um, be reflective of the diversity of the city, I think is an important conversation to have. I think there's been a lot of concerns in how this was rolled out, whether or not communities were engaged and conversations had. Um, so I think that the end goal of having the public school system and our schools uh, all across the board be reflective of the di diversity of the city, I think is an important conversation to have. Um, I'm not in the weeds on exactly how the, the city arrived at its decision, and I know it's been extremely contentious, um, but I think the end goal in terms of that, I think is an important, is an important position to have. So um, again, I don't know how it's been rolled out and I really don't know where things stand with it. I have to look into that a little bit more. And I think also, I know we want, there's this gentleman I had in the front, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, hi, this is reporter from Sintel Daily. So your support to close Rikers, yeah. um, but there uh, is also a lot of protests among local people. Um, I just wonder, uh, from your opinion, how to keep the balance from reforming the justice system and uh, uh, the need of local people? You know, the, the, it's, it's hard, you know, as, as a legislator, as an elected official, when I was in office, I always told people, I will be very transparent and open with you about what my thinking is, and I wanted people to let me know what you think as well. But I may arrive at a decision that you don't agree with. It is impossible as an elected official to appease everybody. Impossible. And if you try to do that, you're not going to be effective. That's one thing. Second of all, when it comes to public facilities or community facilities, whether it's a homeless shelter, right, whether it's transitional housing, whether it's a community-based jail, no community wants it. And so, I mean, you know, we have to, we're a city, we have to survive. There are families that are homeless, there's housing you have to provide, right? There are people that, we're in an opioid crisis, people that need treatment, people that need help. So we can't ignore that reality. So if any conversation we have as a city is to say, well, at some point we need to set up a facility or we need to some sort of, of you know, to provide assistance to this group of people, if everybody says no, what happens? We can't, you know, that's, so nobody ever accepts and it's very hard. So sometimes, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage for an elected official to say, we hear you and we understand, but you know, we're gonna make this work to the best that we can. Now, I believe very, very strongly in the closing of Rikers, as you all know, I called for it and I put a plan forward in terms of having an independent commission. It came out with a set of recommendations and I believe the conditions in Rikers are deplorable and people are, you know, that's just not the way that our jail system should be. 
There'll be those that say we shouldn't have any jails at all. I'm sorry, that to me is not a realistic position to have at this point, right? But how do we create a more humane system? How do we keep people closer to their networks, to their families, so that they can su successfully reintegrate? As we try to re-envision the way we do criminal justice in this city, we want to lower the number of people at Rikers. We want to make sure that there is no two-tiered system. People that, can't, that have money and can post bail can get out. Those that are accused of the same crime but are poor and can't have bail sit in jail. That's, you know, that's an inequality that we should not have, right? That's why we, when I was in the council, we put forward the um, idea of creating a bail fund, right? And we put money towards a bail fund so that people that are low income um, for certain crimes, right, that have been accused, again, accused of certain crimes, at least are able to get out and wait for their day in court outside, back in their family, with their families and reintegrated into their communities. So, you know, we are, we're taking a lot of steps to try to minimize, right? When I put forward the Criminal Justice Reform Act, which I got a lot of opposition, even the mayor and the police commissioner were opposed to it, and I move forward, the idea that if you were sitting in a park after dark or you're drinking a beer on the stoop, that you could get arrested and you may possibly be sitting in Rikers for a couple of days, we changed that mentality, right? Now, those low-level offenses, now you get a fine and you're able to walk away, so you're not spending any time in jail. So all of these different measures that together, you know, we cleared over 750,000 warrants when I was speaker, I led the charge on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, pieces that we put in place to try to create a more humane system, right? We have a long way to go, but those to me are important steps to re-envision the way we do criminal justice. So I support wholeheartedly the idea of community-based facilities. I think it is important um, we have examples all across the country of how um, uh, jails have been re-envisioned. Um, and so, you know, I understand it's a very challenging conversation right now, but I think it's important that we, uh, we, we create these community-based facilities as opposed to having this horrible, I've, I've been to the Rikers, I've gone, I don't know if everybody's, anybody's been there or tried to get there. It is not easy to get to and it is horrible conditions. Uh, so, you know, I think that this is the right approach. Yes. During your time as city council speaker, the de Blasio administration put forward numerous neighborhood rezoning plans, including your own neighborhood yep. of East Harlem. And all of these plans passed despite strong community opposition from long-term low-income residents mm -hmm. who are afraid of being pushed out. If you're elected public advocate, how will you ensure that the city keeps its promise to protect these residents? So, I mean, I, I will say I believe very strongly because we went through a community-based planning process for the rezoning that this district and this rezoning was the least controversial of the bunch because we went through a year and a half process of engaging the community in the conversation and that we presented to the administration what we wanted the rezoning to look like. We, they didn't tell us, we told them. If we are gonna allow for a little bit more density, then this is the percentage of affordable housing we want. These are the community improvements we want. This is where we want the investments made. Um, where we want tenant protections, we want more money for legal services. So. There actually is a tracking system. I don't know if you've seen it. There's a tracking system online for each rezoning where you can see what were the commitments that were made to the community and what is the progress of that. I just saw it for the first time the other day. So we had a document and we got a historic number you know, from the city in terms of investments to this community uh, from the rezoning, some of it towards public housing. I think we got, I think we maybe got 10 to $15 million commitment for some of our public housing developments for certain improvements that were needed. Um, so we, there's a tracking system now where we can monitor where all the commitments that were made to these communities through the rezoning if the city is honoring them. And if they're not, then the elected official and the community can really be, you know, organize around that and ensure that the timelines are being met as originally promised. My understanding is from what I've seen so far is that the city has been moving you know, on a lot of the commitments that were made. But again, the rezoning just passed late last year. Um, but there's already a, a system in place that some of those commitments or many of those commitments are in the process of being, of moving forward. Um, have you seen that website? No, I yeah, I, I should, I just saw it the other day. I'm gonna, I don't know if there's a way I can get that to you, but it was really interesting because it's supposed to be for every rezoning and it's a community tracker of all the commitments that were made. And remember we passed legislation in the council when, when I was there, we passed legislation that the city needed to keep a database 
right, of all of the commitments that were made when these redevelopment plans happen or these economic development projects happen. When there are commitments that are made, people were always afraid that the city wouldn't have, right, or wouldn't follow up on them. So we said you have to keep a database that tracks how that progress is being achieved. And so that's already available and online. So I'll try to see if we can get that to you. Uh, Jose Martinez from El Diario. Uh, Melissa, uh, according to the mayor's office, there are 75,000 uh, New Yorkers that could be affected by the public charge, uh, yeah. this proposal. But it could go up to 475,000, including children. Uh, this includes public housing and food. And um, <laughs> We're now waiting uh, until December 10th because the federal government is still receiving comments, public comments. And I'm going to be submitting public comments. Right, and I think just so we you all know. should be doing that. Yes. Um, but what, what, first of all, what do you think about it? And, and second of all, um, if you win, how would you address this, talk, you know, this issue, knowing that all these people could be you know, facing that decision of either I eat or you know, I move out from a uh, NYCHA building because they could jeopardize right. their green card Their's process. Status. I mean, look, it's, it's just, you know, as we've been saying, this, is, this administration, it's an all-time assault, not only on immigrant communities, but communities of color, low-income communities. And so we have to figure out how do we push back against that. And I know that there's been some mobilizing. Some of our great community-based organizations like Make the Road have been doing a lot of educational sessions in the community, have been organizing around it. You know, I would have to see, and I've been out of office, we have to figure out creatively if there's anything legally that we can do you know, what can we do as a city to try to protect against this, if there's any way. You know, that's one of the things that I am very proud of is my record on standing up for immigrant communities, not only as a speaker, but as a council member, that we looked at creative ways. And it wasn't just coming out of my head, right? My, the, the thing as a legislator, the way you're effective is that you've got to make yourself available to the constituencies you represent. And they have sometimes bring to your attention issues of great concern, the issue of the detainers, um, that we, the, the law that we put in place around the detainers and getting the right, ICE out of Rikers, that came from conversations with the community where they said, you know what? People think that immigration issues only get resolved at the federal level, but there are things that cities and states can do through law and local law to really protect communities. Here's an example. So I would say in the same case, I would want to create a climate in my office of innovation and thought process. Like, why don't we, you know, how do we engage with um, uh, lawyers in the private sector? How do we analyze what can we do? What are the, what's the extent of, of protection that we can provide to our immigrant communities? We've done that over time. That's why we set up the legal fund, right, for those that are uh, unaccompanied minors and those that are fac facing deportation uh, proceedings. I put money, right? We put money as a city towards that. Um, and I was open to really that creative way of finding solutions through government. And so I, in this case, I know that it's imminent. Right now, I'm not an elected official, so I am. It was raised to me um, uh, by the disability community, actually. I was having a conversation with them the other day, and they said, this issue of the public charge affects us, too. What are you, are you going to submit testimony? So they got me thinking, and I said, definitely, I want to submit comment. Um, but you know, figuring out ways, once I'm in office, of what else can we do? You know, I don't have the answers here, but definitely serving as a voice, um, maybe getting, you know, getting other elected officials in the city of New York to stand up for our immigrant communities, figuring out if the state has any role to play in this. So the idea is, you know, I want to continue to make this a priority and to be a strong voice the way I have been historically uh, to defend those that are being targeted. And, and we are constantly targeted. You know, our Muslim brothers and sisters are targeted. Our trans brothers and sisters are being targeted. You know, Puerto Rico is being ignored. I mean, this is an all out attack on our community. So we got to stand united and figure out how we can effectively push back. But it's, it's tough. It's tough and it's obviously contributing to this climate of fear, right? Where people that are in need are not asking for SNAP assistance. Right, people that have legitimate needs that have and should have access to these uh, services are not accessing them because they're afraid of whether the family member is going to be impacted or how the family as a whole is going to be impacted. It is a very scary time, definitely a very scary time. Hello, hi. My name is Abu Tahir. I'm from Time Television. And then, as you mentioned, the uh, congestion plan and Amazon in Long Island City, you know, the Amazon is going to bring about 25,000 people. And the uh, city, uh, I mean, the subway is crowded. Uh -huh. The seven train others. Yes, is crowded. I've taken it quite a few times. Yeah, you know that. It's horrible. In the morning, you have to wait even sometimes half an hour to get in the subway. 
Uh, I mean the train. It's dangerous. Yeah. Those so platforms. these twenty-five thousand people is gonna come. New people. If they have one family member, fifty thousand people. If you know, uh, the because of the headquarter, because every day is there is a visitor will be there. So if two multiply, then one hundred thousand people is gonna visit in that area. There is no additional road. There is no additional subway. There is no additional school. Exactly. And also they are planning to have the tool booth in mm. Queensboro Bridge, which, which is only one bridge from Queens to Manhattan, mm. come free. What is your plan about all no this? I mean, this is, I mean, this is where I say it's ill thought, right? It's, you know, this conversation, one, the fact that the community has been completely, I, you know, removed from any more, any sort of, of process, right? Typically, a situation like this or a project like this will go through a community review process. And the governor, with the approval of the mayor, decided to skirt, circumvent that, right, by through some sort of a, a state process. Um, so that's completely egregious, the fact that the community input and the transparency that a community process brings about um, was completely thwarted, uh, is an affront, I think, to democracy, right? And that's an issue. And the fact that in this particular area, with the serious infrastructure needs that exist, um, how are you going to throw right this huge project in here and that there are state and city incentives that are being provided to it when it's a trillion dollar company right people talk about the jobs that are coming in but also with regards to amazon a, an amazon job is eliminating potentially two or three local jobs right uh, so there's the the squeezing of the balloon kind of situation uh, you have this situation here but then it creates all these other effects and uh, and so that's of concern so i i do not support the project, uh, the infrastructure needs of the city need to be a, a high priority. If we don't get our shit together, it's going to impact the economic future of the city because we have to be able to plan for the future and we're not investing and we're not making a priority the issue of improving our transportation infrastructure. So, you know, this is, it, that's why I'm saying it's all hands on deck moment for our public housing and for our transit system. It affects the future of our city if we're not investing and creating what other, you know, expanding alternatives, more bus routes, getting deeper into the transportation deserts, making sure that we are um, investing in that. There's a lot of infrastructure needs, not just the subways in that Long Island City part. You know, there's sewers and other kind of other infrastructure that people below the ground that people don't. So there's a lot of that was not thought well, you know, was not well planned, I think. And this idea of like, well, that happened and then we'll figure it out later. We don't really have time for that anymore. Uh, you, a few questions ago, you spoke about um, uh, how you supported a, a bail fund when you were yeah. in city council. Something that criminal justice act activists talk about a lot, and uh, I believe uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez supports, is ending cash bail completely. That's a state issue. So that's a, and I support okay. that. But we, you know, as a city legislator, as a city council uh, uh, speaker, our idea is like, what could we do locally that we have control of? as a way of trying to deal with an injustice that exists, right? So this idea that, again, and Khalif Browder, unfortunately, is the example, where Khalif Browder was accused, not convicted, accused of having stolen a backpack, and because his family did not have the 500 to to $1,000 for bail, that poor young man stayed in jail for three years. That is a grave injustice. And someone who was accused of the same crime would be able to get out if they could pay the $500 bail. That's an incredible. So that definitely, yes, I support, you know? Um, and there have, many, there have been many, many, many legislators for many years that have been calling for the end of cash bail, but the state doesn't have the courage and has not had the courage uh, over time to do it. But in the meantime, this is something that the city could do. And so we expanded the idea of this, um, uh, of this cash, I'm um, sorry, this bail fund uh, with some of the local legal service providers. Hi, just to go back to Amazon again, <clears throat> um, instead of just scrapping everything that because we had some procedural problems with the community discussion, which of course like, was a big problem, wouldn't it be better to push Amazon to like, give more to community or would that be like something that you would look into as a public advocate? I think there are examples in terms of their practices demonstrates that that's not something that they're you know, open to. You know, I think that they have, they have a track record of union busting. They have a track record of workers that try to unionize. They intimidate them. They have a track record back in Seattle 
when there was an attempt by the city council to put forward, I think it was like a local tax that would go towards creating more housing for homeless families, that they pushed back against that and they got the city council to withdraw. There's examples there that give me obviously pause, right? Plus, I think this situation is making us and should make us reevaluate. As a state, what do we prioritize? That economic model of incentivizing these large corporations that really don't need to be incentivized um, to give money to taxpayer dollars is outdated, right? We have record low unemployment. People want to set up shop in New York City. So we should be reevaluating what are we incentivizing, right? So the idea of incentivizing corporations and these as of right grants or subsidies, we should be evaluate that and we should definitely think of a new model that really empowers local communities in different ways. That's what I think. It does, it's no coincidence that the two locations that Amazon chose to set up in, where was it? In the outskirts of Washington, D.C., which is the political power house of this country, and New York City, which is the financial capital of the, of the world or potentially of, of at least the country. You know, so it's no, I mean, it, to me, it's hard to believe that they needed any incentive to come here. And so they already had a plan in mind. And so, you know, we needed to ensure that the same way we, we banded around Walmart, that about saying, you know, your practices and what you've done historically, we don't want to welcome those practices here. We have a similar situation with Amazon. So just to follow up, I totally agree with you in saying that we don't really have to give any incentives to Amazon. Of course, they want to be here. As a public advocate, which area of New York City, city then do you think would be a better place for Amazon to go to if they agree to come to New York without any support? I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, that's, I don't, I haven't really thought of that. And I think right now that. Uh, I think we have to scrap the deal completely. That's my position. What do you say about the Trump administration decision to add citizenship question to I'm sorry, repeat 2020? that? Repeat to add the, like, you know, the, the citizenship question. Oh, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's horrible. You know, and, and it's we, you know, I worked with an organization, Latino Victory, and there's other national organizations that have expressed serious concern about it. Uh, we don't believe in it. I, I think what they're doing is, is terrible. Obviously, again, inflicting and in sending this message about how certain communities are unwanted or they want to intimidate or scare uh, in people into the shadows or make them feel unwelcome. Uh, they seem to really be embracing, right? What was that model? Who was the person that, was, that made the comment about like self-deportation, right? Like you're creating a situation, they want to create such adverse situation for immigrant communities that people like, you know, they really seem to be embracing that, that policy, which is horrible. But so I, I don't agree with it. I, I wish they would scrap it, you know, I, and I don't know where it is in the process. I know there were hearings. Obviously, there was a comment period. My, I think of my recollection is that they're moving ahead anyway with it. So it's, it's a real concern. And is that, you know, and that is, is uh, municipalities and states should be very concerned because getting an accurate count, right, means the amount of resources that you're gonna get from the federal government. So if you're undercounting a population, that means that you're impacting the federal dollars that you're receiving for services. So that should be of great concern to you know, any, any governor and any mayor, right? And so uh, across the nation, I wish there would be greater outrage around this. Hi, uh, we Jacobs, Afro, Afro Radio, WBI. Mm -hmm. um, I know affordable, affordable housing has been an issue that of interest to you for some time. It's uh, a big problem in the city, and it's getting bigger, you know, by the minute. Um, there's a lot of abuse by property owners, landlords. Uh, there's a lot of tenant abuse, uh, tenants, and also New York City itself is growing and and. Uh, affordable housing is not growing to meet the population. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about what your role or your position would be uh, in support of tenants and, and um, affordable housing no. in New York City. My track record speaks to that. I've been consistent and very strong on tenant protections. You know, we have pushed the mayor really hard on increasing the amount of money that is allocated to legal services uh, to defend tenants. We passed the legislation under my speakership to ensure that every single tenant has access to a lawyer. And based on that, uh, the council members, Levine and, and Vanessa Gibson, uh, who are advocates, we've seen a, a drop in evictions, right, knowing that. So we have, a, we have a strong record of creating tenant protections and fighting for tenants. Uh, and we, through these rezonings, 
in areas where there is going to be increased development, there's been an increase in the number of resources and dollars that are allocated to those communities to take you know, into account any concerns people may have about displacement or that every, every uh, tenant has um, access to lawyers. So that issue about fighting for more affordability, there's a conversation from the homeless community, obviously, and advocates saying that we should have a greater set-aside number for homeless families. We need to you know, get more money, invest more money go, so that we can go deeper into the subsidy, um, more subsidies so that we can go deeper into the affordability levels than 30%, you know. Eh, 30% is, is low income, but we obviously there's, there's a need to even go deeper. And it's been hard, obviously, because any amount of, of affordability, there has to be an investment made. Uh, so this always becomes a numbers game for, for, for some, of the, some of the leaders. Uh, that you put more subsidies to go deeper, you get less units, you know, it starts becoming this numbers game. But the idea of creating, obviously, deeper levels of affordability, but tenant protections is critical. We've done that. We've worked towards that. Uh, I know the Public Advocates Office has, has this uh, watchdog, the landlord's list uh, in place. I definitely would want to continue that and figure out what other advocacy points or whether it, it, other issues I could embrace and support. Uh, but I've always been a strong advocate for creating more affordability of fighting, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, that I'm making NYCHA a really important part of my platform as well, uh, because that is one of the critical aspects of affordable housing in this city. And it's like literally falling around, you know, and crumbling around us. And we gotta invest in it and make sure we don't lose those critical number of affordable housing units. Um, and if we don't invest in capital improvements, you're gonna have more apartments offline because repairs aren't being made or because the roofs are leaking. You know, so there's a lot, a lot of work that has to happen, but I think my track record speaks very consistently and strongly that I um, advocate for tenants and that I fight for more affordable housing in every economic development project that is brought to us. Okay, we're gonna do the last two questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I think this is important for New Yorkers who would like to support you especially. Um, could you go over a few of the proposals presented by the other candidates and explain how you will um, act differently? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to put forward um, anybody else's positions, right? I'm here to present why I believe I'm the best candidate for this position and that my track record across the years, not only as a legislator, but also as an activist, speak very strongly to being a coalition builder, um, of being one that aggressively fights against inequity and tries to figure out how government can be more responsive to solve some of those inequity issues, to chip away at the systemic racism that exists. I think my track record as a legislator and speaker speak to that. So that's the kind of advocacy that I want to bring into this position. Uh, the people that are stepping up and, and demonstrating the support you know, that I have is reflective of the coalition building because it's across communities. So that's the kind of, of platform that I want to you know, continue to advocate is to be a direct link to the constituencies that I seek to represent, to hear how this office can best serve them. I have those issues that I've talked about that I want to passionately advocate for, immigration, uh, um, public housing, the transit system. Uh, but I'm open, obviously, I want my office to be uh, embracing uh, uh, many other issues, and I want the constituencies that I represent. So my, uh, that's the vision I have as a leader, of embracing, of being inclusive in my governing style, um, and being inclusive in who is going to be working with me in my office and the issues that I take on, uh, and being very passionate, right, about uh, being a voice for communities that have historically been disenfranchised and historically have not had a seat at the decision-making table, that's, that's what I bring to this. And I think that my track record makes me very, very unique candidate. Um, not to speak that I think that as a woman, as someone that lives in the city of New York, representation matters. And the fact that after Tish leaves, and uh, we will not have a woman in citywide governance is problematic. And so as a constituent, I think that's something that matters to me as a woman. So as a qualified candidate for this position, uh, I think that I am the best suited to be the next public advocate for the city of New York. And um, I would hope that in your reporting that your, cons that your readers and people that read your uh, media uh, or watch or however it is that will come to understand that as well. You know, I'm here to make the appeal, to make the case as to why I'm the best candidate. And I'm hoping that that comes across in the way that we run this campaign. Gracias. Thank you so much, everybody.